My name is Robert Freeland. I am with the University of Tennessee UT Ag Research and I will be presenting the data processing procedures that normally follow a GPR survey. I will be giving an introduction to interpreting the basic radar gram, how to establish the correct start of scan to match the soil surface, on filtering GPR data, and on the procedures of migration and deconvolution. GPR works by pulling an antenna over the surface that is both transmitting electromagnetic pulses and at the same time receiving their reflections off layers within the subsurface having different dielectric constants. It is a reflection waveform that is digitized and recorded. Reflections near the surface appear at the top of the waveform and reflections deeper in the surface lower in the waveform. The reflections are displayed as a wiggle trace recorded side by side as the antenna is pulled across the surface. The amplitudes of the waveforms are typically color coded. I use a 256 color scheme where the positive amplitudes are brighter versions of the negative amplitudes. When displayed in color, they're called a line scan. The horizontal surface distance is increasing to the right. It's in units of meters or feet. The vertical distance is time, which relates to depth. Typically, this is nanoseconds. The GPR data that I will be using today we obtained this summer on a golf putting green. The putting green was constructed to very precise and specific United States Golf Association putting green standards. It has a one foot deep sand layer that overlays a gravel blanket and within trenches are laid three inch diameter plastic grain tile. This is a putting green that's under construction. It's been excavated. The trenches have been uh, dug in a herringbone pattern, the plastic pipe laid in the trench and backfilled with gravel. Now on top of this, you'll put the gravel blanket. Now on top of the gravel blanket will be put the one foot of sand. Uh, to the side of the putting green where they excavated this wall, where it goes from sand to the natural grade, this is very apparent in the radar gram. This is the side of that wall in the radar gram where you're on the natural surface and then you go on top of the sand. You have the horizontal surface distance increasing in meters, units of meters, the depth in nanoseconds increasing with time. The range, 40 nanoseconds. So the operator set this to be 40 nanoseconds, recording 40 nanoseconds worth of reflection data. Uh, each waveform is digitized 512 times, uh, increments of 512, and the samples are 16 bits per sample. The horizontal units, you have tick marks pointed out by the yellow arrows. The units of measure are set to be meters such that there are uh, three meters per mark. So you have three meters per increment of tick mark. And there are 40 scans per meter. And so over three meters, you would have 120 scans. This is a target, one of the drain tiles. It's a hyperbola. There's another drain tile, another drain tile. Almost missed one here. This is the reason why you sometimes you change your color, color scale. Sometimes you use a different color scale, you can see things differently. And so by going to grayscale, I was able to see this fourth hyperbola. I barely caught the edge of this drain tile going over it. One of the first things that a bystander will do when you show them a target in the radar gram, they'll say, well, how deep is that? Well, coming over here, you say 20 nanoseconds, it doesn't mean much. And so they want to know it in feet or in meters. So what has to be done is you have to 
synchronize or set the top of the ground wave to zero nanoseconds. So you have to subtract out this uh, about three nanoseconds here. This is done by the function auto peak. Uh, you simply look at one of the waveforms, you see where it starts to peak out, you set the offset and tell it to run and it subtracts out approximately three nanoseconds across the entire scan. Uh, note that you no longer have 40 nanoseconds worth of data, you only have 36, 37 nanoseconds of data. But you have synchronized zero nanoseconds to be the top of the ground surface. Now the depth, based upon time, converting time to depth, you have to know the dielectric. You have an equation that has three unknowns, one equation, three unknowns. Typically you know nanoseconds, you're measuring nanoseconds, you know the depth in time to the object. So you either know, have to know the depth to that object such that you can calculate the dielectric, or if you know the dielectric, then you can calculate depth. You can go to lookup table, and depending upon your media, if you're, say, uh, surveying in sandstone, you can plug in six, and you can get the depth that way, converting from nanoseconds. But typically, I'm, I'm surveying in soils and sediments, and look at the range from four to 30. Not much help. Uh, the dielectric changes with the texture of the soil, with the moisture content of the soil, and so four to 30 does not really help much. So how do we calculate uh, depth if we don't really know the dielectric. Well, there's two ways of doing it. You can actually physically measure the depth of the object and then put in the depth of the object and calculate the dielectric for the rest of the profile. Or you can take a handheld soil moisture meter that uses dielectric to calculate soil moisture and just simply have it display the dielectric. Last summer we actually used a, a dielectric meter and came with up with 14.53 for the dielectric of the sand of the golf course. And that matches fairly close to the wet sands of the table, 15. By plugging in 14.53 in for the dielectric, we can now switch the vertical scale to units of measure of feet, meters, centimeters, millimeters, whatever we choose. And so we have units of measure both in the vertical and in the horizontal. At one foot, we have an interface, which would be the interface between the sand and the gravel. And so approximately at two feet, we have the top of the drain tiles occurring about two feet deep. Filters. Filters ideally extract information without distortion but they always distort. I only use filters for a client or for a presentation where you have to clean it up for someone who really doesn't know radar. If you know radar, you really don't need to have a lot of data, a lot of filtering going on when you're discussing radar images because somebody looks at horizontal banding, they know it's, it's, a, it's a horizontal noise or if you see static, you know it's vertical noise. And so the use of filters are really used for final presentation for those that really don't understand radar grounds. A low pass filter is a filter that if you have a, a waveform that has both high frequency and low frequency noise, it only passes the low frequency. As opposed to a high frequency filter that only passes the high frequency. You can have a bandpass frequency that filters out both the high frequency component and the low frequency component and you have nothing. Now choosing the filter parameters, all the settings on the filter and what type of filter you use, what the cutoff frequency is, it is an art. Now there are some guidelines such as setting the high pass frequency equal to or slightly lower than the high, highest frequency to be eliminated. and setting the low frequency equal to or slightly lower than the lowest frequency to be eliminated, but it's still an art. It is from site to site and very specific. And so it's simply looking at the data and playing with the filters and seeing if you can have it, uh, clean it up to how you want it. But again, you are distorting your data. Uh, it's best not to use filters if you can get away with it. Here's an example. Uh, this is 2.6 gigahertz antenna operated on over that golf uh, putting green. 
it has both high frequency noise in it and low frequency noise. Uh, the high frequency of noise occurs both in the, in the vertical and horizontal components. If you look at the vertical waveform, you see how erratic it is, how much static, how much uh, jagged it is, how much high frequency noise. And so if you put this through a low pass filter algorithm, the vertical, it will clean this up and have smoother waveforms and get rid of all the, all the uh, sharp static that you see in the vertical. You also have static in the horizontal. You can put in a horizontal low pass filter. There's low pass, there's low frequency noise in the horizontal. That's these bands, all these uniform bands going across here. In nature, or almost anything other than something that's not man-made, you do not see horizontal bands like this. The only way that you will see horizontal bands like this is if you're reflecting off something that's going along with you. So if you have a, if you have a coupling or you have a, an encoder mount or or something near the antenna that it's bouncing off of consistently is causing this horizontal. Or you have ringing noise. You all you have a you have an interface that you have multiple ringings down through there. This rarely occurs in nature. This perfect horizontal, and so you can tell by just observation that's horizontal noise. So what's good in this image? What does this image have? Well, what's changing? The low frequency that's changing, and that's occurring right about one foot. I've not done auto, auto peak here. If I did auto peak, it would shift this up to about one foot. And this is the top of the gravel layer. And so that's what I'm seeing. The difference between the sand and the gravel, a very high resolution change in the gravel with the top of the gravel interface with the sands here. That's about the only thing that I see worthy of, of mention here in this, in this data to the noise, but it's what's changing slowly. Here's an example from the GSSI manual where they're removing horizontal noise. Uh, the upper example has the horizontal noise in it. The reason you know it's horizontal noise is this is a natural profile of the earth. Nothing occurs perfectly like this that deep. Uh, these very flat reflectors so you know it's some sort of uh, reflection from the surface. To remove this horizontal noise you simply pass it through a high pass filter such that anything low very low frequency at this depth is eliminated and it's uh, so you eliminate the, the this this banding effect here migration the hyperbolas that we saw the drain pipes uh, if we want to collapse those hyperbolas into a round dot to make it into a pseudo image uh, for interpretation uh, <clears throat> you do use a process called migration. Here this one migration, they, they fitted it to this one hyperbola at a certain depth with a certain dielectric, all the parameters for this one hyperbola, and it did it perfectly. However, the other hyperbolas at different shapes of different sizes of different dielectrics, it did not do as well a job. And so if you have multiple hyperbolas, different sizes, different shapes, different depths, different dielectrics, and you use a variable migration. Where you use a single migration process is if you have the same size hyperbola at the same depth, at the same dielectric, and you get that whenever you're using wire mesh or rebar. And so that you use a single uh, migration process there. Why use migration at all? Well, if you weren't trying to make a pretty picture in 3D, if you want to collapse all those hyperbolas into dots and you want to show those dots as uh, continuous pipes in a 3D to make it look like a sort of a 3D x-ray image, then you would collapse the hyperbolas using migration into small dots such that you can show them in 3D. Here's an example of multiple uh, hyperbola, multiple, multiple depths, multiple sizes. We have wire mesh, we have rebar, we have voids. Uh, this would require migration, variable migration, not single migration. One migration setting would not do all this. You'd have to use a, a variable depth migration. Deconvolution. Deconvolution is a process where you remove ringing in a certain spot. Anybody that's ever surveyed over a metal pin, pin flag that's been wadded up underneath the ground and you see the reverberations of that going straight down. You just see a straight 
a vertical line of, of pulses going through the profile. That's a ringing noise. Anytime you go over metal objects, you a nail or a metal pipe or something, you have rever reverberations going down. If it's not through the whole profile, it's just in that one spot, you use something called deconvolution. And on the golf course example data set that we had, I ran deconvolution, and it did the ringing noise outside the uh, the plot, but did not inside, did not get the horizontal banding through the whole profile, just the ringing noise that occurred when it was on natural grade. When we came onto the putting green, it, it, it left that alone. So deconvolution is that it removes horizontal noise going through the profile that is not consistent across the entire profile. It's very localized and it's referred to as ringing noise. In summary, <clears throat> I gave a basic description of a radar gram, how to establish the start of scan, talked a little bit about filters, low and high pass, vertical and horizontal, when to use them, when not to use them. Talked about migration, which is used to collapse the hyperbolas into round circles for 3D display. And the process of deconvolution, which is removal of ringing noise in the radar gram. I need to give credit to GSSI for using some of their images out of the Radan 7 manual. And also uh, Allred et al., my crew, the crew that helped uh, gather the radar data this summer on the golf course. Thank you.